I'm Tim Peel and you're watching Nasty Knuckles. Listening to Nasty Knuckles, the Hockey Outlaws Podcast, with your host, Terry Nasty Sotomayor, and former Philadelphia Flyer Enforcer, Riley Cote, as they go behind the scenes with your favorite NHL players. Time to face off. All right, welcome back. What's happening, Nasty? Well, what's up, Rigorelia? Back from another trip to Africa or <laughs> Jamaica or wherever the hell you were this time? Yeah, yeah, it was, was it? Uh, it was nice and warm. You're not as tan as normal. No? You mean you're tan, but usually you seem a little bit... You get a little crispier? Sun. Was it, uh, was it rainy? Yeah, it was a little overcast. Oh, was it? A little overcast, but... In the jungle? Yeah, well... Kind of? Par- partly. Partly. <laughs> Still got some sun. To have a good Didn't time. always look pasty white. You're not pasty white no, at all. No, you're tan. No, it was a great time. Yeah, I actually had a, a an athlete retreat, and uh, if you do you remember the name uh, Kevin Cauley? Yes, remember that you know yes. smaller guy who was mm-hmm. in the Islanders yep. organization. He was down there. He actually played 16 games with the Islanders, and the 16th game he broke his neck. I don't remember that. Oh my God, no! It's back in like uh, 2008, I believe. So he's been down wow. and out since then. He actually was uh, working for the Dallas Stars, but just really couldn't get out of the funk, depression, uh, just su- suicidal ideation, the oh whole bit. God. Anyway, see, he was one of the guys down there, and. Uh, uh, he had an amazing experience, Good uh, transform, transformational. Awesome, so he's he's doing well, um, but just you know, interesting how things come full circle. You know, yeah, he, he right. saw the ESPN thing. He reached out. Oh, he did. Yeah, and then uh, you know, just kind of voiced his struggles, and you know, obviously he got in the plane and showed up and did oh, the work. So it's awesome, man. It's always nice to see this type of you know medicine helping people and just that's h- really how cool. how how powerful it is because again like what is that 15 years yeah. he's been just down and out and nothing's worked therapist after therapist doctor after doctor nothing's worked so um good for him a little man. mushy there awesome. ass then all of a yep. sudden he's uh I, it, it's backing awesome, himself man. i really like seeing i get a lot of messages from people just like screenshots or at a bar there's somewhere oh, yeah. and then they're show they're always they're showing it yeah um and a lot of other people just reaching out saying hey man i saw it's pretty powerful uh stuff so that's that's good to hear man that uh he saw it and you got to help him out yeah i forgot it. i do remember that name though yeah, yeah i sure do fought him a couple times yeah. there yeah. yeah we talked about it did was he upset you beat him up no no he was uh he was grateful for it he was grateful yeah. all right well he, he understood the business and he was in that line of work too so uh, he's a scrappy yeah, young guy for sure for uh, sure but uh all good yeah good experience good, man how about you uh, just been grinding, sucking in metal dust from <laughs> blades, and uh, didn't just, have that dust up in the high jungle. <laughs> no, they didn't have that in the high jungle. Uh, did uh, camp with the rebels. We had main camp. Uh, nice. Two hundred kids. Wow, God, man. Yeah, two hundred kids. Um, cut it down after a couple days to eighty, then to forty, and then I think we we're down to about thirty-five, and then they'll, they'll all come to camp. Uh, in a few weeks, actually, it's coming up pretty quick. Yeah. So, um, that's about it, man. Just been working, grinding me, Debo and baller been trying to carry nasty knuckles along while you were on vacay, you know, all the time (laughs) doing a good job and cuddles, cuddling it up. And, uh, you know, that's about it, buddy. Yeah. Well, I hear you. Some news while you were gone. Yeah. I saw that. I got the news too. You, know? you did yeah, get it. Oh, you, there's, there's a little thing going right there. Right there. <laughs> uh, no, Patrice Bergeron, man. Shut yeah, it down. I didn't see that one coming, Nast. <laughs> well, you know, we talked about when at the end of the year how he waited. He was the last guy, kind of crying a little bit, emotional, yeah. hitting everybody's handshake and hugging uh, all the players. But I had talked to a couple of our friends, uh, equipment guys there. Um, when we we're in Arizona, and they're like, "Ah, we don't know because he's training his ass off." So I was like, "He's gonna come back one more year," you know? Like, yeah. Um, and then you know, I guess he decided, and uh, you know, twelve hundred ninety-four games regular season not a bad was, was enough. not a bad career six uh selkies i think baller said yeah um what a career man and, and what a what a human being yeah. too. like just a just a great guy absolute pro um, god man it, it uh it was a scary situation for him remember when randy jones oh hit yeah him? like jones he did obviously wasn't purposely yeah uh, to, to injure him he just went in as one of those weird uh things and you know he probably saw his career 
flashed oh, before man. his eyes that was there. Because I think he missed, if I'm not mistaken, he missed most, probably the rest of that season. I'm not sure if he did or not, but uh, um, that was a scary situation. But what a great player. And um, I'm sure he'll have something to do with the Bruins. Oh, I would think so, right? What's uh, Jim Montgomery thinking about this? I don't know how happy Monty <laughs> is about this, but um, he's such a good coach. I'm sure he'll figure something out. And I'll ask him next weekend. We have a 25th right, year yeah. uh, anniversary for the Philadelphia Phantoms when we won in 98. What a crew. Um, That'll be fun. What a crew. And, and we have almost every single player, uh, with the exception of two guys we, we couldn't find, and then two that unfortunately uh, had passed away in the last uh, year and a half or so, Andre Payette and uh, Garrett Burnett. Right. Um, going to miss those guys. Obviously, yeah. we do every day. But um, it's going to be a great time. Everybody's coming. Uh, it's crazy. We've had a group text going for like two months. Oh, and it's so It's awesome. almost like we're back in 98. Because yeah, it's right. It's the same it hasn't dumb changed. shit. Yeah, yeah, it hasn't changed it's at hilarious. all. It's hilarious. Frankie just saying shit that he could go to jail for. Yeah, basically, right. Basically, like he did when he was on here. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it's funny. Like when <clears throat> I've known Jim Montgomery for so long. He's a head coach in the NHL, but I knew him as a player. Right. You know, when he's a little shyster. Yeah. No and kidding. it's funny because on our things, like he's saying shit like he would when he's playing. It's just, it's fun to, you know, talk to everyone like that and kind of catch back up. I can't, so I can't wait for next weekend. So uh, I'll ask him how he's feeling about Oh, I can't <laughs> wait to hear some stories about yeah. that weekend. Yeah, for sure. Should be a rodeo. Should be a rodeo. Your boy, Tom Wilson. Oof. Wow. That's Signs a, a new ticket. deal. Seven years, six and a half sheets. You should have kept playing, Riggs. Oh, man. No kidding. <laughs> he yeah, threw you on line with Ovi. I'm guaranteeing 10. Easy. Oh, easy. Off your body. Maybe more. <laughs> no, he's a good player. Oh, he really, like, he really he, like, is. I mean, he's, he's a hell of a player, he's man. He's that like, power forward you want on your team. He's you definitely that up. guy. You lock him up. Yeah. Whether you love him, you love me. You probably love him in Washington. You hate him if he's on the other team. He's yeah. had some questionable hits, but dude, I'll take that guy on my team any day. Totally, of the week. yeah. He shows up when he has to, and he, and he's a he's a, he's actually a really good guy. You know, you yeah. We, met, we got to really get to talk to him when we were down with uh with our Tovey with with Tovey with the sticks and everything, and he was looking at him. He was hurt at the time. He was, but, yeah. Um, yeah a he's a hell of a player, man. That's a, that's a that's a. Good for him, man. Yeah. That's a great deal. Yeah. A, yeah. I you mean, know what? It, it, my God. Honestly, I was a little surprised, just surprised to see the length of it. But uh, nonetheless, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, because you, you said, it's like, uh, how old is this guy? Yeah. You know, get yeah. a seven year deal. But I mean, nonetheless, where are you going to find a, a power forward like that around the league? You know, there. it's like, you may as well just lock him up. He's part of the organization. He's fr a franchise. He's a one of the franchise players. Yeah. Right? I mean, first round for pick. Sure. So. Um, yeah. It's a good signing. It's a good signing for them. And <clears throat> you wonder how uh, long Washington's going to hang on to this little core they yeah. have. Their power play is still effective. Yeah. But other than that, you know, I, I don't know how good they are. But anyway, um, Sebastian Ajo. Yeah. Another <laughs> big one. Thanks for coming. Oh. Now, there's a guy that's put points up an eight year deal. Yep. 9.75 sheets, bro. That's, that's a lot. 10 smell. That's okay. a lot of cake, bro. <laughs> What do you do with that? Invest uh, in Jamaica? Go buy up an island or two? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but, boy, they locked him up. He's there for good now, I, yep. would, I would say. And um, Heck of a player, though. Yeah. Not a very big guy. But yeah, he's crafty. an effective player. Yeah, crafty player. And, um, good score. Claude Giroux uh, talked to Tara, Vladdy Tarasenko into signing yeah, in right. Ottawa there for one year, five mil. Yeah. Um, took a while to get him on a team i know everyone has cap uh issues that's for sure but um wasn't sure i saw him going there but i guess I maybe that him. takes up you know they lost to brink it yeah um, they need somebody to put the puck in the net and and uh claude drew's a guy and get him to puck put yeah, in that so exactly uh be interesting to see how they do um in ottawa this year if they, if they get better and then uh debo's guy troy terry huh. gets a seven-year deal seven smell he's i said Debo, I, is it not a lot? He goes, he was good two years ago. <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> I'm just saying. No, but uh, heck of a deal, man. Lots of cake. And yeah, I know, house. right? Yeah, should have been a skill guy, Nast. Well, you? you are a skill guy. But, uh, I mean, yeah. I should have been a skill guy. You did I all tried right. Tried to. You did all right. Mm. Now you're lighting it up. All-star game coming up this week. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. Is that tomorrow? Tomorrow. Saturday. Whew. Saturday night. You have all Voorhees. these teams. Yeah, and Voorhees. And you have all these people asking you to play checking for charity because we're not going to be able to because of my um, my reunion. But uh, I can't believe you're not going to play. Cost you 
Deli wanted you to play, Ray. Wanted you on the team. <laughs> well, I just couldn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have going on, man? Well, there's not enough time in a day. Yeah, I know. Well, we, we found that out today, boys. We, yeah. We so I haven't played in like over two months, All-Star oh, game. you'll be fine. No, yeah. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. So Should be a little fun. Anyway, great guest today. Yeah. Yeah. Good friend, Timmy Peel. Yep. Timmy Long-time Peel. referee. Yes, NHL. sir. I think we're ready to rock your ass. Let's do it, man. Episode 124. Here we go. Woo! Woo! Welcome back. I'm Riley Cote. And I'm Derek Settlemeyer. This week, we are very fortunate and excited to have veteran NHL referee of 1,362 games. Riley, 90 playoff games. This guy did the Olympics. He did All-Star Game. He did... Uh, two winter classics, I believe, and ZZ Top wrote a song about this man. It's called Sharp Dress Man. Yeah, because this guy, <laughs> he looked good when he walked into the arena in his suits, and he looked good on the ice. I swear your shit must have been tailored, Mister Tim Peel. What's up, brother? Hey, boys. Thanks for having me on. Listen, you read those stats, it's hard to believe they fired me, but I'm sure we'll <laughs> that's <laughs> the truth, man. That's the truth. But no, you know what? It's funny. Uh, Derek, when I people said, "Where'd you get your style?" and and when I was a kid, I was 13 years old, and we lived in a trailer park. I, I I was adopted and lived in a trailer park in New Brunswick, Canada. And beside the trailer park was the golf club, and I started working there, cleaning clubs and caddying and so on. And then uh, the head pro moved me up to the pro shop, and and he wasn't a very big guy, and he kept giving me all his golf clubs. And so I'd always be like a sharp dressed kid <laughs> at the golf course. And my mom really uh, always made sure I looked nice, even though we didn't have a lot of money, always made sure I looked nice when I went to school. And it was always kind of something that just stuck with me. So it, de- yeah. it definitely had. I always used to say, like, we had this joke, like, I'm a terrible hockey player. Like, I grew up in North Carolina, but. I loved uh, Kovalev's style. Like everything yeah, yeah. seemed perfect on him, his gloves, his pants. So I always would say that. Like I'm trying to, I'm like Kovalev, and I actually kind of got to know him a little bit. And he signed a jersey for me. And it said, "Too nasty." I love your on ice style, <laughs> and, but, but you 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 always look good. Even your your ref uniform looked tailored, man. Like you're just always well, looking sharp. Well, you know what? And that's a funny thing that you brought up because. All our guys now, they, they taper their pants, they taper their jerseys and so on. And a quick story, I was working in a game in Ottawa 20 years ago. And you guys remember Chad Kilger? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I roughed him in the OHL. And, and so in in Ottawa, they had this minor hockey week in which the, the some local referees' kids will come in the dressing room and dress with you, and then they'll go on the ice and – skate around and stand there at the national anthem and we'll talk to them before the before the game about you know what levels they're doing and all that so they're like 13 14 15 and you know my son plays here in st louis so when i go to a a game you know i see kids and their pants are too long or they're too short or their shirt looks like three sizes too big for them and and so i'm doing this game in ottawa and we're skating around with these minor hockey kids and Chad Kilker comes right up to me and he goes, Hey, Peelzy, he goes, he goes, I didn't know you were working with Dean Warren tonight. And Dean Warren was used to be on our staff and he wasn't a very good ref and they let him go. But he is, his pants are always too short. It, <laughs> he, he had like the ear tab still on his helmet. He just didn't, he looked like a minor referee, a minor hockey ref. And so I go to Chad, I go, I'm not working with Dean Warren tonight. I'm working with, you know, West Macaulay, whoever. And he goes, no, no, there he is over there. And he <laughs> to one of them, I swear to God, at one of the minor hockey kids. And and to your point, though, it was that was the perception that these players had, that they'd look at him, and he didn't look like a referee. And I remember, and it's, you know, this guy's good friends with, with you guys, Scott Hartnell. And, and – I was one of the last guys to put a visor on. I didn't want to wear a visor. Well, then in our new CBA back eight, 10 years ago, we had to put a visor on. And the first game that I was doing in the preseason, I'm, I'm skating around in Columbus and Hartsey's playing for Columbus. And he comes right up to me and he goes, when did you, when'd you put the visor on? And I go, and, and that's my point. Even these guys are sitting on the bench and they're like, 
because he's wearing a visor now. Like you wouldn't think they'd notice things like that, but they do. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. Notice. Yeah. That's why I brought it up. Cause like, I always noticed like you could, you can tell, you can tell guys when they're, you know, they take yeah. care of themselves oh, sure. and the way they yeah. look and, uh, it's so, pride in the way you look. Yeah. You look good well, you sometimes I wear those, those, you know, those vests that the, some of the players wear that it's got the cushions in them. And yep. yeah, I'd, I'd wear those because I was built like a pigeon. So I, like, <laughs> I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta bulk up a little bit and look like I'm somewhat in shape and I get to the gym once in a while. <laughs> oh, yeah. Great, got man. to. Nasty's probably the best dressed player in the adult league. Oh, in the adult league? Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's got the tongues out, like you said, oh, like yeah. Kovalev, like the perfect to, one inch between the shin pads. I, and pads. I actually, I actually sew my socks so they're tighter, like <laughs> Kovalev's <laughs> were. Guys, been playing, and then I, and then I step out there and try to play, and, and that's when it, that's when it ends. Uh, <laughs> well, I, like I look it. good in pictures, though. Yeah, right, exactly. Pictures. But um, Timmy, so so how did how did you get your start in officiating? Like like when did that start? Yeah, you know what? It actually started. Uh, I mentioned Caddy and working in the pro shop in New Brunswick. So that when that uh, fall rolled around, I lived in a small town called Hampton, New Brunswick. It was twenty minutes outside of St. John. St. John had an AHL team, Derek, as you know for years, the St. John Flames. And uh, actually, Marty St. Louis played there, which is unbelievable. And uh, so when the fall rolled around, like I said, we didn't have a lot of money, and I missed having the spending money, but. So in our town, it was a town of 1,500 people, small, small Canadian town, one rink. And that's where we were at every day as a kid was at the rink. And mom and dad, I was 13, and mom and dad were like, why don't you start refereeing the six and seven, eight, 10-year-olds? And I started doing that for, you know, this was back, um, I was born in 66, so this is 79, 80. And uh, I started refing the little kids for fun. And then... Went to the University of New Brunswick, and I lasted a whole uh, one year there before they kicked me out because I didn't go to many classes. So, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I just kept refereeing. I kind of enjoyed it. It was that good extra money. And then, as you guys know, the American Hockey League back in the 80s was huge in the Maritimes. They had the Edmonton Oilers farm team in Cape Breton, uh, Toronto and Winnipeg quite often uh, shared the Moncton Hawks. Uh, and then, and they were the Moncton Golden Flames at one point. Brett Hall played there. Holly played in Moncton. Uh, we had a team in Fredericton, the Fredericton Express, and the Fred Claude Julian played for the Fredericton Express. But then they became the Fredericton Canadians, which was Montreal's farm team. And then we had the team in St. John. So, how it works in the American League is the NHL would send in, like I was when I started in '98. I would go to different IHL cities and they would use local linesmen. So I was the local linesman in St. John, Moncton, Fredericton, and, you know, Don Van Massenhove and Mick Magoo, the different guys before they made it big, they would come in and I, I'd work the, the lines in the American League. And I remember in, I think it was in early nineties, I sent a letter to the NHL. I said, I'm interested in becoming an NHL official. And Will Norris at the time was the director of officiating and uh, he sent me a letter back and, and this was in the late eighties, early nineties. And as you guys know, especially in Philly, you know, the Legion of Doom, if you were a small player in, in the late eighties, early nineties, you weren't getting drafted. And that's why it took a player like Marty St. Louis a long time. And, and so many young guys that are playing in the NHL now wouldn't have been able to play in that era because they were only drafting guys that were six foot and so on. And every linesman that they were drafting, they were dra or, or signing, they were signing them. They had to be six foot plus. And the same thing with referees. You had Don Van Massimo and Mick Magoo. And, and, you know, he had the anomaly with Kerry Frazier and so on. But most of these refs were, were taller in stature and they said I wasn't big enough. So... I got my break, uh, the, the company I worked for moved me to actually transfer me to Toronto and I got into the OHL and, uh, and then uh, lucky enough at the time, the OHL, they scout referees like they scout players. So old names like John D'Amico and Brian Lewis and guys that used to officiate in the NHL, they were now working for the NHL and they would come out to different games in the OHL. I wouldn't know that they were in the building 
And then uh, I was lucky enough that in 98, they, they offered me a job. That's wow. Awesome. What a ride. So did you, did you actually ever play hockey, like organized hockey, or was you strictly ref? I did. I was I was a, a decent player. I was always a good skater. Um, but I was small. Like, I didn't like the rough stuff. I liked to I, – I was a goal scorer. And, uh, but I didn't make it very far in hockey. And I quickly realized that, that, you know, as a kid in Canada, as you, you guys know, everyone dreams like this golf course that, that was beside the trailer park I lived in. And it sounds like such bullshit, but it's the truth for Canadian kids back in the seventies and eighties and nineties. We would lug these nets through the woods, go to hole number 12. It was a par five. Bottom of the hill, there was a pond. We'd scrape off the pond. We'd be out there all day, you know, all night until we lost the pox or it was just too dark. And I, I feel like sometimes I, I wish my kids had an opportunity to grow up in that environment. You know, we live in a couple cul-de-sacs here in St. Louis, and if I don't see them for two, for you know, a certain period of time, I start to get nervous and I, you know, go look for them and so on. But it was different growing up back then yeah and uh um, and it was a good way of life it was a simple way of life back then not all the social media now that we have oh, you know, fuck, my, yeah. and and my kids are on the phone and their ipads and you know john wooden who was a, a real famous uh basketball coach i think at georgetown he uh he had a quote there a couple of years ago he goes i hate when i hear that when people say that kids have changed, he goes, kids haven't changed. We're the ones that allow them to change. You know, I'm, after our, we do the show, I'm going out to cut my grass. Well, an easy way for me to say, hey, keep busy is go play Xbox or but, or uh, get on your phone or whatever. But my kids are pretty good. Bronson, he's a good little hockey player. And, and uh, up until this year, he played for Jamal Mayers for the last two or three years in St. Louis. And He's out shooting pucks and he, you know, I had him at the gym this morning. He wants to go to the gym and work out and he's 11 years old. I'm like, I love it. He's not drinking okay. soda. He's not, he's like, I'm, I'm committed. And I, and That's I awesome. So, yeah. That's awesome. I, yeah. my son's playing, uh, unfortunately he's a goalie. Oh, uh, all of us. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, it's funny. A few, few years back when he just started, uh, he, he kind of got thrown into the net and uh, he liked it. And Ron Hextall was, I was still with the team and Hex, he was the GM and he goes, he called me Deke. I don't know. He always called him and Mac T Craig McTavish called me Deke, but yeah. he's like, he goes, Deke, you don't want that. He goes, <laughs> he goes, when you get home tonight, he goes, you fire one of those uh, orange hockey balls right off his fucking forehead. Yeah. And I'll never want to get there again. I go, Hex, he's five. I can't do that. He goes, yes, you can. He goes, <laughs> Trust me. So I did, I didn't do it, but it, uh, he still, well, so you, he's enjoying a muffin. So it wouldn't, yeah, have yeah. Did anyways, you hear dude. that shit? Yeah. Did he, he said, I shoot muffins. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you got connections, but it's expensive, man. This this bullshit about hockey's for everyone is ridiculous. My you know, my kids skates this year are seven hundred bucks and I look at the price of goalie equipment out there when I go down to our local hockey shop here and I don't know how some of these families afford it. It's just it's a travesty what it, these companies are getting away with charging, really. It, yeah. It's okay. crazy. I I'm fortunate because of obviously yeah. working in hockey for twenty six yeah. years. I, I you know, I've got most of Elvis's stuff pretty damn close to free. Um, and it's ex like you said, it's crazy. I mean, I buy skates and, you know, odd things here and there, but I was fortunate uh, to get a lot of stuff for free. Vaughn is, is, Vaughn is pretty, really taking care of him. Is he a pretty good little goalie? If he's not around, yeah, he's not bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to tell him that, but yeah, he's doing, he's a piece pretty athletic and he's, wow. he's unlike me. I, I played believe it or not, I played college basketball, even on like very short, uh, his, his mom's side of the family, they're all tall. So he's almost, he's just turned nine and he's yeah, like, he's, he's up to my shoulder already. Oh, really? So he's, he's got a chance. His uncles are six, four, six, five His grandpa six, five. Like, so, um, he's got a shot, but I mean, not to make the NHL, but he's, at yeah, least, yeah. he's decent yeah. player. He's, you know, he is what he is. And, He's a little fucked up. I don't know where he gets it. No, oh. yeah. He's got Let's some issues, Timmy. Yeah. <laughs> I blame my dad. I blame Sudsy uh, for it. But uh, I had a question for you because when I was uh, in college, um, <clears throat> I worked at a, a high point university in North Carolina. And uh, 
once you got to, once you were a player in college, they had team camps for eight straight weeks and you, and you were an official, you got to be a, a ref. And I always was like, uh, I can't wait till I'm playing in college and I can be a ref. I'll tell you what, man. And I've probably said to you before, like, I is one of the hardest fucking, and that's, I'm talking about high school. You, you're at the highest level. That is one of the hardest fucking jobs. And I, and I don't know if it's always appreciated. I think guys like Riley, guys that played the game and guys yeah. like me, the equipment guys, the trainers, they understand what you, the, the pressure and all that stuff. But like, man, like Riley was, I, I kind of just stole your thunder. You were going to ask him, how did you prepare for like game to game? Like, like going into that kind of situation. Well, I drank a lot of red wine the night before. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's familiar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we did that a lot on the road too, as you guys know, but we had a lot of fun. You know, you gotta have, there's not as much fun now. I, I don't think with, with the younger guys, it's a business and, and I get that, but you still have to have fun at it. And, uh, but our guys, you know, I'll, I'll tell my kids or friends if we're at a blues game, I go, just watch the refs when they come out and skate out there. Now, these guys are incredible athletes. It's not like mm-hmm. years ago where, you know, guys were overweight and, and it's, it's like that with the players now. It's a 12 month uh, a year job. And a lot of it's physical fitness. If you're, you know, as you, you guys know, Riley, if you're not in shape, you lose your focus during the game. You know, so our guys are in incredible shape. And basically it comes down to, you know, if I was working a game in Philly, you would have been there, Derek. It was when, uh, it was Lindros's first game back to Philly. And he was playing for Toronto. And Don Van Massenhoven and I pull into the rink and everybody up top there, you know, where you know the where they can look down to where the players park and so on. Everyone's got Lindros jerseys on with a big X through them and we're like, you get pumped up. You get you you yeah. get excited for every game. But listen, let's be honest, if it's a Tuesday night in Columbus and at the time we'll say Carolina is not very good. Or you're in Philly on a Saturday night and Toronto's in there and Lindros is there, you're you're pumped up for this game. And, and our guys, you know, go into every game prepared. But you're th- and so anyway, Donnie and I were watching the pregame warm up on the TV in our dressing room. And all of a sudden here, you know, you got Darcy Tucker, Gary Roberts, you got LeClaire, um, you know, all of the Legion of Doom, you know, and uh Everyone's at center ice shoving and, and going at it and they separate on their own. And we, so we're in the dressing room going, this is going to be fucking fun tonight. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Like I would rather a game like that than just a game that there's two tripping penalties the whole game. And yeah. you know, anybody could ref that game. You want the games that are tough. So it's just about preparing yourself throughout the day. No different than a player. We get up in the morning, we have breakfast with our team at the hotel, go work out in the morning, have lunch, have the pregame nap. You know, everyone would, I'd love, friends of mine were like, you nap? And I go, yeah, my, my day's starting at, you know, five o'clock or 5.30 when we get to the rink. So um, it's, you, you know what, as much fun as we had on the road, you got to get your rest because, you know, that what's that, some, uh, that line, you know, um, when you're hungover, you got to, uh, you're, you're playing, uh, playing guilty, playing guilty. guilty. Yeah. Right. Playing guilty. Give me a few playing guilty? Yeah. Right. Just a few. Yeah. Well, hey, hey, you know what, Timmy, at least, you, at least you didn't have to do the morning skate. Like some of the boys, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. like, exactly. my partner here, I like if, we, we would have, if he wasn't in the lineup, we probably, we were, we would get after it a little bit. Oh, and, yeah. uh, then he, this poor guy had to go get bags, get all I had to do was hang jerseys and shit. Oh yeah. That, that would have been brutal. brutal. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I love hearing that you were emotionally connected to the game. Like the, like the players are, it was, it's interesting perspective. I'm also curious on like, you know, like how players mentally prepare with a chip on their shoulder, right? A little bit about ego flex, you know, I, I have obviously, you know, you, you know, running into refs that, whether it's something that happened in other games or or whatnot, relationships with players, like how you mentally prepare from an ego perspective on how you're gonna, you know, kind of come into the game when you're with your presence. No, that's a that's a great question, Riley, because I I think you know I was in the league 23 years, and I really think the last 
12, 13 years, I think the first eight or 10 years, I took myself too serious out there. Mm. And I maybe came across as cocky. And there's a fine line between confidence and cockiness. Cockiness is no good as, a, as an official. You've got to be confident. And I, and I remember Stephen Wacom, who was my boss, he said to me, he goes, I think you take yourself a little too serious out there. And, and you guys know this guy very well because you would have seen him a lot, Derek, is, is Paul Dvorsky. Yeah. And yep. Paul had one of the best personalities on the ice. He would joke and laugh, but when he had to uh, step in and show his authority, um, people res- respected him. And uh, so I think the first few years I took myself – even though I didn't intentionally do it, but when I came in in 1998, well, 2000, um, we were just going into the two referee system. So I'm working with Don Koharski and Kerry Frazier and Mick Magoo and, you know, guys that have big personalities and, and been around the league for a long time. And I felt like I kind of needed to make my stamp on, uh, in, in the game and on staff instead of, maybe just sliding in a little under the radar. And then it, I found towards the end of my career, it got me a lot more just being down to earth and being approachable and, and not taking things so serious. Yeah. I can relate to that from a different perspective. Cause it's a, there's a fine line of like, yes, you're, you're for sure for you position of authority. So you got, you know, you got to have, you know, that, that flex on it to some degree, um, you know, and, and, and in my role, it was kind of the same thing. It was like, you know, I'm a pretty like easygoing guy, but I'm also in a position to like, I have to flex and like, you know, and I'm also in a position I have to like, you know, fight and defend. So I always struggle with that, that line of like, how friendly can I be without showing a sign of weakness almost. Right. And I'm sure you battled something similar. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, that's a, that's a great point because you, you, you don't want to be, Bill McCreary, who I think is probably the best referee that ever left in the NHL, he could be a real prick out there. Um, but he said to me once, he goes, you never want to be liked by everybody, but you do want to be respected. Mm. And so there's a fine line in getting too close to the players and uh, being buddy-buddy with them because eventually you're going to have to call a penalty on them and, and – maybe throw him out of the game or call a penalty on him at a crucial point. And he looks at you like, I thought we were buddies and that's, that's no good because you're going to have to step in and, and, and show your authority. So, you know, one note on Philly, I loved my, it was one of my favorite cities to work in. And uh, you guys know the sign guy there. Oh yeah. yeah. (laughs) He's still floating around. He's still there. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah, He was there at the end of my career. And so, for years, I'd come out and he'd hold up the sign, ref, you sock, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so one night he comes over to me at Chicky and Pete's, and he's like, hey, Timmy, I'm the sign guy. And I'm like, hey, let me buy you a beer. And we had a bunch of beers together. And, and I, he quickly realized, you know what, this guy's a good guy. It's just his role is to, you know, is to call penalties and and, and uh, police the game. and. And it's not always going to go in the favor of, of, of maybe the home team or whatever team. And, and so he was such a good guy, though, because after that, every game, I'd say to the guys in the restroom, I'd go watch for the sign guy. And we'd come out, and he'd hold up a sign, welcome back. Every sign. Every oh, time, that's awesome. Back. Because, we, we, you know, we weren't friends, but he, we, we got to know each other, and he realized, like, we just had, have, had a job to do. Like, I remember when I, when I retired and I was allowed to go on social media, I'd get fans from every city going, you hated Montreal, you hated Toronto, you hated what? I'm like, no, actually, like, I'd always loved the Toronto fans, so you hated Toronto. I'm like, I grew up a Toronto fan. Like, I didn't, yeah, right. I didn't hate the Toronto Maple Leafs. First of all, you guys haven't got out of the second round in 19 years. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you want to blame the refs every year. Like, and yeah. uh, it, it was funny, you know, to hear the fans saying, you hate, you hated our team. And I'm, I couldn't have been any further from the truth. Yeah. yeah, it's it's funny. Like 
you, it's your job. Like you have to, <laughs> you have to make those calls and you know, it, it is funny how people think that. Yeah. Like, it's a thing. It's, it's a thankless job. Right. I mean, it's like, you can't do anything right. <laughs> Cause no matter what side <laughs> well, you're going to be yeah. mad. Right. Like it doesn't matter. Somebody's going to be mad at you. you know? I, yeah. I, I got a question for you. And, and we've talked about this uh, a lot. Um, when, when things like this happen, um, the players these days, like say you're officiating the game and, and, and there's a guy and he's like going to be hit. Right. But he turns himself last second and then it's a hit from behind. Like, and they don't seem to protect themselves anymore. Like by putting their hands or anything like how hard was that for you? Because you know, like that's just, that's one of those things. Like you see it guy goes down, like it looks, awful. It, it looks awful, but at this part to me, I didn't play the game. He did, but yeah. I'm like, this guy turned last second and you know, we don't have to tell you how fast the game is. Like what's the guy supposed to do? Like, you know, in that situation, if, if you're going in to make that hit where it would have been a clean hit to the side, but the guy turns last second. Well, you know what, that's really what differentiates uh, a good official or a, uh, an average official. So there's 34, 34 refs in the NHL. Uh, they take 20 to the playoffs every year. 14 guys go home. And the guys that go home are, or the guys that continue to work are the guys that can differentiate whether the guy turned at the last moment or he didn't. And you're not always going to get it right because you're, our job is to protect the players. That's what our number one job is, is, is an official in the NHL is to protect the official or protect the players. And so it's a great point you brought up because it happens a lot these days. But as a as an official, you've got to have that's what separates the West Macaulays from the guy that's number thirty four on staff. Is you've got to read the play and say, "Hey, I'm sorry you're hurt," and you you go over to the coach or you talk to the captain and say, "But he turned at the last moment," and and there's nothing that that it's completely different than when the guy's looking at the numbers and he comes in and hits somebody. Right. But the guy turns quickly. That onus is on him. Right? Yeah, that discernment is important. And just like to, to what Nasty was saying, like I almost feel like the players today almost use that as a defense mechanism. It's almost like strategy to some degree. Like I grew I was growing up in you know, a little bit of the old school era where it's like you protect yourself. Like you don't put yourself in a vulnerable situation where now it's almost it's either not being taught or it's some bit of strategy to almost you know lure a guy into a penalty. Um, but it's got to be challenging, you know, the, the speed of the game, like that discernment. You know, but you're saying like obviously guys are good enough uh, at observing that. Um, but you know, do you guys have these internal dialogues before games of like guys that do stuff like that to maybe look at, look like look out for that? Yeah, for sure. And the league does a good job uh, monitoring uh, embellishment. They they called it diving. I don't think the players' association liked. Uh, we would announce the penalty as you know. Um, so and so two minutes for diving. It, you're kind of embarrassing the player when you when you're you are embarrassing the player when you call him a diver. So they change the verbiage to embellishment, and it, it makes me think about a player, uh, Michael Bunting, playing for Toronto last year. I'm watching this game, and and he takes a stick right here, and he snaps his head back, and the ref got sucked in because high sticking is a tough penalty to get in real time. It happened so quick. Yeah. Uh, the six are there and he got the power play. And, and, and so what happens is our guys, I, you know, after every game, whether it's, you know, having a glass of wine in my room by myself after the game and, and, and looking at, at certain clips, I would watch every game, even uh, the next day if I'm traveling and I put on my game and Towards probably the last six, seven years of my career, it wasn't really critiquing the penalties that I was calling. It was more my positioning because I was getting older. I had to read the play. You know, you got Connor McDavid coming down on you, skating forward. I'm 55. <laughs> I'm 55 years old, skating backwards. You know, I felt like one of those turnstiles of the runway, <laughs> right? And so, you, so I had to read the play, and I, I would more – look at my at my positioning and where I was. But those type of players put the officials in a bad spot because what happens is a player can – Nazem Kadri when he was in Toronto, mm. I would say to the guys, 
if you're going to call a high, it, you, it was almost like clockwork. If they, if Toronto was down and he was, he would be on the ice in the last couple of minutes, he's going to grab his face at one point because he's trying to get us to call a high stick and penalty. And I would say, I wouldn't say to the guy, don't call it, but if you're going to call it, you better be a hundred percent sure that he got a uh, high sticked in the face. Because if not, we're doing a disservice to the game and, and the team that they're playing by giving them a, uh, an advantage that was an unfair advantage. It wasn't warranted. So certain players um, dig their own grave. And yeah. it takes a while for them to sometimes get out of that. You know, I remember Max Lapierre, he played for Montreal. And I was in the playoffs one year. And that was the year um, – Price either got hurt or was playing so-so. And I don't know if you remember this nasty, but uh, Yaroslav Halak was playing for Montreal and, and they were playing Washington and he stopped like 65 shots in one game. It was, he was unbelievable. And I went into work game six with Dan O'Rourke and the league was on us about calling embellishment. And we called, Dan and I called three embellishment penalties against Montreal in, in the Bell Center in game six, one of them was against Brian Gianta. He did a barrel roll. And the other two were against LaPierre. And I remember throwing my arm up for the third one, the second one against LaPierre. And I remember throwing my arm up. It was like the second round of the playoffs. And I go, well, and I'm thinking about this. I go, well, this might be the last penalty I call in, in the playoffs this year because they're either going to send me home or they're going to be happy that, that I called it. And so Lapierre was known to embellish all the time, throw himself into the boards, grab his face. And it puts the officials in a tough position because 99% of the players uh, are honest players. Right. Yeah, it's got to piss you off as an official. <laughs> yeah. it, it could, like you said, you get turned one way, you you can't tell. A guy throws her head back and then – you then you see it probably or after the game you find out you're like that motherfucker yeah like, you know it's it's that's that sucks actually. yeah it's, it's got to be a challenging piece of it and then like you know so that being said you know we're talking about embellishment but just like dealing with players like in that world where some guys have you know obviously bigger egos bigger chips on their shoulders going into games coaches that have the you know similar type of tendencies like is your mental preparation like oh, i gotta deal with this and i have some sort of strategy on how you're going to communicate with some of these guys yeah it's gotta be challenging right some guys some guys you know especially the, the like you know a couple of my best buddies here in st louis are relo and kelly chase and yeah. cam jansen you know and you know guys like riley guys that played the game we knew what their role is i can never remember having a bad relationship with an enforcer on the team because they knew they were honest players. They, they uh, respected the officials. They knew the linesmen sometimes were going to be their best friends. If they were happen to be not doing so well in the fight, the linesman was going to go in and protect them. And it was the little rats on the ice that, that made it difficult for us because they would pretend like they're, they're your buddy, buddy, but then when you turned your head, they're poking somebody behind the knees or they're, they're doing something dirty. And so I didn't have a lot of respect for those guys. And, and subsequently, I didn't, I probably didn't have good relationships with them. And I kept them at arm's length because I knew I couldn't trust them. And I knew they were, they were working me to get an angle right. so that they could, you know, when I wasn't looking, give somebody a cheap shot. And, um, just, you know, didn't have a lot of respect for players like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah. It's funny. Cause I think the feeling is the same for, for us, right. Is like guys that are honest versus they would call them snakes, rats, whatever term you want to put on it. But yeah, there's a lot, there's a lack of trust, you know, like it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to think that these guys are genuinely, you know, your friend or, you know, you know, brushing shoulders for an honest reason, but I guess that's the game, right? Um, you know, these guys, it's obviously a lack of confidence to some degree for these guys because otherwise they wouldn't have to feel the need to do that. But right. there's always going to be those guys, and there still is to some degree. And, right? and, and you know, and in fairness to them, there, you know, there's there's uh, there's a reason some of them last for a long time because they're good yeah. at it. And, yeah, right. Uh, point. Um, so credit to them. You know, I never played in the NHL, and some of them have played – a lot of games and so everybody has their role and it's our job to 
um, to police it the right way and, and call an even and fair game. Like that's all I ever tried to do was make sure it was even and fair for both teams. And, uh, you know, you, you, you never wanted a team or the coach to leave or the, you know, to go and he really screwed us tonight intentionally. You know, you, 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 you know, that old adage, you know, if nobody knows who the refs are, then they probably did a good job. Yeah. There's a lot of validity to that. And you just mm-hmm. want to be fair and, and uh, you don't want to be the factor on why a team won or lost. Right. Now, that being said, any, any beef with, say, a, a coach – where you, you, you kind of, you know, reflect on the way he spoke to you and you say, motherfucker, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to show him type of deal. Anything like no, that or try um, not to. It's funny because you guys had him in, in Philly for a long time. A lot of our refs didn't like being, you know, for some reason. Hmm. And, uh, you know, he's got that squeaky voice a little bit. And he, ch- <laughs> he, tended to, he tended to chirp a lot from the bench and, and uh but i always liked the land i i respected him and i always got along with him same with tortorello I, you know a funny story it was um he was coaching in columbus and and nick felino was the captain of of columbus and and when i was in the minor leagues i had uh uh mike felino their dad was coaching Hershey and I screwed up a call one night and I went over to Mike and he's a head coach, you know, he's part of Colorado's organization then. And, and I explained to him that I got the call wrong and he was like, Timmy, we're all on the, we're in the American league for a reason. We're all trying to get better and hope and hopes that we can make it up. We can all make it in the NHL. And he was so, he was just such a man about it and, and not demeaning and, and so professional with me. And so, when Marcus and Nick came in the league, I always had a soft spot for both of them. And, you know, I loved how Nick, well, both how they play, but Nick was the leader in Columbus. And, and one night I called a penalty against him in Montreal and, and he goes, you don't fucking respect me. You don't fucking respect me. And it bothered me for weeks. And, mm. and the first game that I had Columbus again was in Columbus and, we uh, we show up at the game, myself and the other three officials, and put our equipment bag in the room, and I said, I'll be right back, and I didn't tell them what I was doing, and I go knocking the, on towards his store, and Bradshaw opens the door, and I know Shazi well, and I, I'm like, hey, can I speak to Nick? And he goes, sure, come on in. And Torts is like, yeah, you want to speak to Nick? And I go, yeah. So he goes and gets Nick, and Nick comes in, and I said, you said something to me a few weeks ago that I didn't respect you, and I go, I couldn't be further from the truth. You're the leader of this team. I love you fight, you score. I've got a tremendous amount of respect for you. And you know the relationship I have with your dad. I said, I just want you to know that I do respect you. And we hugged it out and he leaves and Torts looks at me and goes, we fucking need more of that. That's awesome. Oh, that's Fuck, okay. I, never wanted a player, I never wanted a player to not think that I didn't respect them, you know, I may not like their style they play, or they might have caused me a lot of grief, but I respected all the players and the coaches. And when you talked about the coaches, you know, we have a lot of good people in this game. And I would just, I would always say to them, hey, we're all in this together, man. Like, it's a fucking world here right now. And I'm <laughs> do the best I can. You got to control your players. And I know you're going to not agree with with every call I make and funny story. It was my thousands game and I was, I was working it in St. Louis and night before the game, my crew was staying at the Ritz Carlton in, in Clayton there in St. Louis and Joel Quenville was there. And Joel and I always had a good relationship when he was in St. Louis and he, now he was working for the Blackhawks. So we had a couple drinks that night together and I love Q and, and hopefully he'll be be back in the league soon. I'm sure he will. And uh, so, thousandth game, they bring my wife and kids out and give you flowers, and they give you, you know, the the players are giving you sticks and jerseys, and and you know, it's a feel good moment. Everyone's all happy. Well, the first five minutes of the game, we got two headshots. Back, <laughs> you no, know, it was a shit show. It was a shit show. And Bacchus and Taze, the two captains, are fighting in the first period. Quenville standing on the bench, just fucking yelling at me, like, <laughs> to me. I'm like, and but that, but that was he would be the type of guy you'd see him after, and he's like, hey, feel you, you, you want to grab a beer or something? <laughs> yeah. So, but in the heat of the battle, 
it was, you know, there were no yeah. friends in the heat of the battle. Oh. You know, they were looking for every advantage they could get. And, uh, and I remember we because we might have had a few pops the night before my, you know, my thousand team. And, and so we come in after the dress in the dress room afterwards. And I was working with Kelly Sutherland, Brad Kovacic and Derek Amell. And they looked at me and they go, next time you have a milestone game, could you maybe work it with like Florida or something? <laughs> but I mean, they, Chicago, Chicago, St. Louis, it was just a war the whole night. It was fun. Oh, that's yeah. fucking awesome. Oh, man. That's awesome. I did know, uh, I did know you had your thousandth game there. I was talking to, uh, Bert, uh, Birdie earlier today, Bert Godin, um, who's was a former equipment manager and uh good friends with Chad O'Neill as well. I yeah. know, you know, you know, both of them. Well, yeah. two, two really good friends of mine. Uh, I had a f- quick story. I have to tell you about birdie. So we did the 2016 world cup together, right? Yeah. Actually, actually we did, we did a world championship together. I think we did the one in Latvia together. Yeah. Your, your, those pictures of you guys doing those are in his shop. So I go down and get, uh, you know, and I, I think you were doing it and, when when he left the blues and well yeah. when, he left, when he you know they let him go yeah um I, I still go down and get my skate my son skate sharpen with bird and i love bird as you yeah. know tremendous guy but he's got picked those pictures of you guys oh that's cool on those teams yeah so so i'm all what riley can tell you i I do stupid shit. I think's funny, but it is, you do? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so Bertie, he's like, he would, he was always like, man, I wish we could work together more because like no one ever fucks with me and you just fuck with me all day. Like I, <laughs> and, and, and Ray Barilli would just be dying laughing. So I, I, I just, I don't know why, but I had this, we're, we're in Columbus. We started camp and the guys had come in and, we're pulling their all their bags and separating everything, putting their USA bags, getting their gear together, and all this stuff because the next day we have practice. And Birdie's always he's always on his phone. It would take him to do twenty pairs of skates about five hours because this guy <laughs> he's got the machine fucking running, like talking to me, and I'm like, Birdie, go finish the skates, man. So uh, anyway, he's in the, he's in the middle he's in the middle of the locker room in Columbus, and I'm just like, I'm gonna fuck with him. So I come by and act like I'm on my phone and I'm like, Dean Lombardi was the GM. And I'm like, Hey, Dino, what's up? Fuck Birdie's head whips around. <laughs> he wants, cause he wants to know what's going on. Right. And he says, and I'm like, Oh shit. Okay, we can add a player now. I thought it was too late. All right, Harry, let me, let me grab a pen. Birdie's like, who is it? Wait, what's going on? What's going on? And I'm like, hang on. So I act like I'm writing this shit down. So I hang up. And he goes, what's going on, man? And like, he's so hyper, right? Like, he's like my dad. Like, he's he's like my, he he worked for my dad, Sudsy, uh, when my dad was with the Flyers in, in yeah. Maine, Portland, Maine. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm like, we just added some dude, Felix Slasinger. And he says, <laughs> what? And I say, I, I, that's D, I was Dino. And he goes, where, where the fuck's he play? I said, I guess he's some college phenom. He's right on hockey <laughs> DB. He's fucking going, right? So. So I act like my phone rings again. I'm like, what number? You know, like we say 87, like some number. And I'm like, all right, let me, let me call. I got to get nameplates made right away. And, and Birdie's like, right, like following me all through the room. Right. So he's like, are you fucking around? I can't find a Felix Slazinger. I'm like, Slazzy. I'm like, so now I'm saying Slazzy. Right. So the next morning he's like, he's like, fuck it. He goes, I love you. Fuck around with me. And I'm like, I said, the guy's coming in. I'm not fucking around. And, and he's like starting to believe me, right? He goes, I, why can't I find this guy? I'm like, I don't know, man. Ask Dino. So I go to Dean and we're getting, the guys are going on the ice. And I said, listen to me, I'm going to go on the bench. And I said, can you just walk by and ask me if I've got Felix all taken care of with his yeah. gear? So <laughs> I'm standing there two minutes later, Dean Lombardi comes walking by. He's going to sit with Homer up in the stands. He goes, Hey, Nast, he goes, is uh, Felix all set? You, you good with him? And I'm like, Oh yeah, he's good. You know, he, uh, all the shit's coming in tomorrow. He's like, "All right, thanks, man. Sorry for the last minute." He walks up, Bert's fuck like, "Holy fuck!" <laughs> He's like, "What the fuck?" So now I got the players saying to Bertie, "We're slazzy." So, the, so finally, I had to tell him. Obviously, it was bullshit. But the whole World Cup, we were terrible. We lost every fucking game. But we we're always we always say slazzy, like how slazzy doing? <laughs> maybe because you're slazzy. He, he was in for three days. He thought this guy was coming in, oh. Felix Slazinger. Yeah, yeah birds are best. you know what it's, it's uh a lot of our guys 
sometimes not a lot of our guys some of our guys would take advantage of of the equipment managers and uh you know some of my best buddies were were Bert and and uh, uh, Pete Rogers and Nashville yeah. and you know these guys do so much for us you know like we, we carry two sets of, of uh, you know underwear and so on right and you know it's it's not very glamorous but as a ref we we get all excited that there was a washer and dryer at the Marriott we're staying at so we could wash our stuff after the game but if not. We'd give it to the guys before the game and ask them if they could wash it and so on and sharpening skates and fixing equipment. And, and, you know, it's, uh, you guys were a big part of, uh, of the success of our guys because without you guys, you know, we didn't have the, we didn't have anybody to take care of us. Yeah, no, it, we had a, I had a good guy there, Eddie Tuka and, and oh, Phil. I loved Eddie. Ed, Eddie's, yeah. he was unreal. Like, I didn't even have to check on Eddie. He, no. I, I, every time I, if I would see one of you guys, they'd be like, Eddie's got us. You know, like, he, he was he was great. He's still there. Ed, um, Eddie would always be, Susie would come in, though. He'd be looking at the counter to see where the money was. That we'd be <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was, he was, he was looking. Uh, time, you know he'd be back a few minutes later you guys need yeah, yeah. <laughs> see if that cash is up there oh I never, I never saw you on the uh the massage table uh flyers massage table like uh Kerry I, Frazier, that, that, getting that, the morning massages <laughs> no but that who's that guy is he russian or who's the guy you had in philly in the back room there it's like a chiropractor massage guy Oh well, it might have been Tom, Tommy. I don't know. We've oh, had we yeah, had a yeah. few. It was we had yeah. Tommy, we had Jack Brad Smith. We had yeah, a few. Tommy, I think he wasn't Russian. Yeah, yeah. And man, if I was sore or something, you know, I don't know how some of our guys did it because a we're flying commercial. We're not we're not on charters. You got Mike Civic, who as a linesman, he was six foot eight without skates on. <laughs> yep. And now he's got to fly on a commercial plane and, and no wonder his back was always all fucked up and he had to go see you guys because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm five ten at the, yeah. on a good day and I, I had all kinds of leg room. Yeah. Poor, Civi, poor Civi, he'd have yeah. this big, you know, with legs out in the aisle and so on. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, every once in a while I'd get a massage from the guy in Philly, but they were always busy, so... Yeah, they good they were good. We had good guys. The yeah. Masseuses were good dudes we had there. Um uh Timmy gotta ask you, obviously, about the whole the bad situation where you, I, I think I heard you say I I just said the wrong thing. It came out wrong on the hot yeah. mic, the whole situation. Um yeah. it, it was a shame because you were a month away from your you know, your last game, which would have been in St. Louis, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm surprised you heard about it. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, it wasn't right? much said, but no, it was only on Fox and CNN. <laughs> was it on Time Magazine or something like that? It was in People Magazine. People, People Magazine, Magazine, sorry. People, yeah, um, yeah. It's funny it's because uh, it, it's it's actually taken me a lot longer um, to get over it than I thought it would, and I'm still not over it. And I don't mind saying to you guys. Uh, um, you know, I reached out to Chaser and Glenn Healy probably a month ago because I was still struggling with it. And, and the PA hooked me up with a guy to speak to here in St. Louis. And I've been seeing him once a week. And, and because when it ended, there's not a day that literally not one day that goes by that I don't think about how my career ended. And it was literally, it happened March 24th. And my final game in St. Louis was April 24th, four weeks later. And the Blues had made tickets up, uh, Tim Peel's final game. Uh, I had 150 people. The Blues had given me a couple suites, you know, big Walt. Everybody was coming to the, to the, to the game, uh, that game. It was an afternoon game. I picked it on April 24th because it was a two o'clock game. We were going to the country club that I'm a member at and having a party there after at seven. It was just going to be an awesome day. And so the day that of my situation, um, I was walking around after lunch in Nashville. And to my point earlier about the equipment guys, I wasn't going to see Nashville again. So I went out and bought a nice bottle of Camus wine, 
for the game, I, I go, I walk down, I got a coffee and a dip in and I go into Pete Rogers office and, and I'm sitting there and I give him this bottle and I said, I just want to, I'm not going to probably see you again. And I want to thank you for everything you've done for me over my career. And, uh, Todd, uh, uh, Richards is in there and he was an assistant coach at the time for John Hines. And, uh, we're just sitting around shooting the shit. You know, my daughter's a horseback rider. We're talking about horses and our kids and not even nothing to do with the game that night. And so finally I'm like, Hey, I got to get out of here. And I leave. And you know, the last couple of weeks before that, you know, I just wanted to get in, do my games, get out, no controversy, not piss anybody off. I wasn't going in there thinking that I, you know, I, I just wanted to get in and out and, and ride off into the sunset and uh so we go do the game and i call a penalty against nashville and the you know the my verb it just came out wrong i said i wanted to get a fucking penalty against nashville it sounded like i really wanted to get a penalty against nashville and we i think we had one penalty in the game so far and i was working with a veteran kelly sutherland and the play happened literally 10 feet in front of him and i should have just let it go because he had a good look at it and i thought arvidson kicked the feet out from the detroit player and so when i came over the box it was more me kind of not kind of but being embarrassed because kelly's you know he's worked 10 stanley cup finals and here i am from the neutral zone calling a, a tripping penalty it wasn't like it was a high stick or a high flagrant foul and I go, yeah, it wasn't much, but I wanted to get a penalty against Nashville. Well, I didn't want to get it. We called, I think the entire game, we called two penalties against Nashville, maybe one against Detroit. So game ends, Nashville wins, nobody's saying a word. Well, the, the Detroit feed picked it up, uh, um, but they didn't air it. And the Nashville feed picked it up and, and aired it. And obviously within 30 seconds later, it's on social media and running rampant. So we come in and, and my phone's ringing. As soon as I sit down, it's Stephen walking my boss and he goes, we got a big problem. Oh boy. And I go, what's that? He goes, you're caught on the mic saying you wanted to get a penalty. And I go, Stephen, that wasn't the case. So I quickly shower, I go down and I, I talk to John Hines. Uh, David Poyle had already left the rink. His PR person put me on the phone with David Poyle. So David, I, that is, was not my intent to, and he goes, I know, and John was awesome. And so I, you know, I'm back at the hotel and I'm talking to Wes McCauley, the president of our association. And, and, uh, first when I get off the phone in the dressing room, Sudsy and, and the two linesmen are looking and going like, cause it was really a nothing game. Nothing was going on. And they're like, what's going on? And I go, I may get fired tonight. And they go, what? And I go, yeah, I go, I may get fired. So get back to the hotel and write a letter to Mr. Bettman and Bill Daly and Coley and Steven and say, this is not what I meant, blah, blah, blah. And show up at the airport the next morning because I'm told to go home that night. And 7.30 in the morning, I'm at the airport and my phone rings and Steven, he goes, you worked your last game in the National Hockey League. And I said, I knew the decision was made. So I literally, it was a two second conversation. I didn't grovel. I didn't, you know, I said, no, you know, I didn't say, oh, don't do it. I go, okay. I said, I gotta let you go. I gotta get on my plane. So I get on the plane. I don't have time to call my wife. I get on the plane. Now it's all over social media, the news and so on. So my wife's getting text messages from her girlfriend saying, are you okay? You know, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, now she's got to look it up. So I get home. So as I'm driving home, like 8.39 in the morning, my phone is obviously blowing up. It's like it's like when I scored the goal off my crotch. And, and, <laughs> and that's a funny story. And, and Gretzky texts me that night. He goes, you've only got 755 goals before you Brett Hall. And I and I slapped with my wife because I said, I said, I guess I've arrived. I said, Wayne Gretzky's text to me. So yeah. now I'm driving home and I get this Columbus number and I don't know who it is. And it's David Clarkson and David hated officials, hated yeah. ref. I thought he hated me. Um, and I thought he, when I answered the phone, he said, hey, Tim, David Clarkson, 
I thought he was going to say, it looks fucking good on you. I never liked you, blah, blah, blah. And he, he had played with Marty Berger in, in uh, Jersey and, and I was friends with Marty and golfed with him in the summertime. And, and he phoned Marty and asked for my number, which I was impressed with. And he's like, I just want to let you know. He goes, I, I'm retired now. I live in Denver playing with a lot of ex pros. We got off the ice today. We heard about what happened. And I just want to say, um, when, when I saw your name on the board in our room before a game, I knew we had one of the best refs in the league, but I also knew we had one of the fairest refs in the league. And I said, David, thanks for that. It means a lot. So I had a lot of those phone calls that morning. And now I get home and my wife's crying and I'm crying. and It's a fucking shit show. Yeah. And Chaser, I'm talking to Chaser that morning. And so now it's 1.30. My kids are still at school. Now I, I got to tell them that they're not going to get, because they were pumped about going to my last game. And it was supposed to be fun. They come in the dressing room after the game and Holly and Chaser and Walt and everybody would be in the room and my family. And it was supposed to be a fun time. And now I got to tell them. And, and so Chaser calls me at like 1.30 and he goes, say, hey, I got some bad news for you. And I go, you got some fucking bad news for me. <laughs> have you seen the day I'm having? He goes, he goes, Bobby Plager just got killed in a car accident. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit. Fuck. So social media in St. Louis quickly changed from me to Bobby Plager. And Chaser uh, loves telling the stories like, he goes, yeah, he goes, I said to Peelzy, he goes, Bobby loved you so much, he thought he'd take the heat off you that day. Oh, and so now the kids get home and, and, you know, this is 2021, so they're nine and seven, and I get on my knee and I got to look at them, and they knew Bobby and Bronson, and he'd always say hi to Bronson at the games and or at that uh, at the rink and because his grandson played, and, and I to tell him that, Bobby had passed away and I'm crying. And now I got to tell him that dad's your dad's done. He's, you're not going to get to see him rough again, again. So it was brutal. It was a tough, tough day. And, but it was the calls that I remember that day, Roanick called me, Quenvo called me. I could go on and on. Brian Burke, the Sutters, uh, presidents and, and coaches of teams, a lot of players, text messages from a lot of players that I didn't have the number. And, you know, at the time I didn't have a lot of current players numbers and, and it made it, it helped a bit. Um, but it was still difficult and, and, but you know what, like as, as tough as it is, like I said, say to people, I go, listen, I, I was adopted. I was in an orphanage for a short period of time. I, I lived in a trailer park. I didn't have the best life growing up. Um, somehow I got to the NHL and had a great career. And now it's time to show some balls and, and not hide in the basement and feel bad about yourself because you've got two young kids um, that you've got to be a role model for. And, and I have these referee camps in St. Louis. And I would, I said to them one day at this camp, I go, I go, life's pretty, because they wanted to hear my story. And I go, life's pretty good right now. You're in high school. Like mom and dad probably bought you a car, got a girlfriend. Life's pretty good. But I go, guess what? You're going to get kicked in the balls a lot throughout your life. And it's about how you come out on the other side and how you prevail and, and about your perseverance and resiliency. And as, as, he, as much as I sound like, I'm, I'm, you know, that's where I'm headed and that's so on. It still bugs me and that's why I need to go and, and I'm speaking to somebody to try to get past that and quit worrying about uh, really what other people think because my friends, uh, just to wrap this up because I don't want to bore you, but a couple of weeks later after my incident, we had our people at our house and one of my good friends down the street, he, I said to him, because I kind of tell everyone it's a little walking on eggshells, and I'm like, hey, everything's okay. Everything's fine. Let's have fun tonight. And he looked at me, and he's in front of everybody. He goes, Peels, he goes, you're not our friend because you were an NHL ref. He goes, you could have been a garbage man. You're our friend because we know what type of person you are and the heart you have for people. And and so that helped. And But, yeah, it's it sucks because – I, it still bothers me that wasn't the way it was supposed to end. But guess what? I guess you can't write your own story, and you've got to you got to find a way to get past it and move on. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a shitty situation because like, I, I, like you said, it, it came out the wrong way, but th- how many times it's way worse is probably, oh, I yeah, mean, right. it's not even like, yeah. it's not even close. I mean, you even guys come back to the bench and be like, this guy, he just told me he's going to fuck me. You know, like he's going to fuck me on, but you know, like, what, it's just a shame it happened to you. You're such a good dude, man. And, I think I think a lot of it was the NHL had just brought on uh, gambling partners, and uh, uh, it was kind of new to the. It was very new. They had just brought them on that, for that season, and and uh, I think that was a big part of it. And then at the end of the day, it's it's kind of the world we're living in now. You know, yeah. I mentioned Rowan it before. Like he make, makes a, a comment about. You know, one of his his people he, that he works with. Well, she and his and and Jr.'s wife are best friends. Like, yeah, they're best friends. Yeah. Like, the they they canceled. Can, he just said a stupid thing. Yeah, they didn't mean anything by it. And it's like the cancel culture that we're living in now. It's like if something somebody says the wrong thing, man, they are on you right away. And and uh, it's not right, you know. It's but it's the world we're living in, and and I guess we all need to adjust. So. Yeah. yeah, we're all yeah. under a microscope with the yeah, social media, especially you know, in your position and in, in, in that time and space. But yeah, I think there's always like, and you, you obviously probably have noticed this. There's 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 so many lessons, hard lessons in these difficult situations, right? And I think you're probably still unpacking it a little bit. Um, but that's just life. It's just constantly throwing it's shit sick. sandwiches at you, <laughs> and well, you know, like you know, right. it's like you have this grand plan, but you know, sometimes you, some things you just you know. You, you can't fully control and um yeah i think i think you're gonna probably find some peace in it all you know yeah. somewhere down the line you know there's probably yeah. something to, to think, really dig out of it i think so you know i'm a big believer in things happen for a reason and and i'm not it's my wife certainly way more religious than i am but and i i think she'd like like me to be a bit more but um but i am a big believer in in things happen for a reason and and at the end of the day, like, you know, here in St. Louis, nobody gives a shit that, you know, I, I'm coaching, you know, a couple teams and whether I'm at the golf course or wherever, nobody gives a shit. Like, like at the end of the day, people just care about what kind of person you are. And they don't, everyone's got, everyone's got a story and they just, you know, is this guy a good guy or is he is he a bad person? And, and that's how you need to live your life. You, and it's tough, though, because I am a sensitive guy. I know that. So for a while, it really bothered me. Like, I'd walk into a rink and, and you know, is everyone talking about me? Is everyone saying, hey, there's Tim Peel? Well, well no, no, everyone's everyone's moved on from that. Nobody gives a shit. So yeah, what I need to do is is move on a little bit quicker than I have. Oh, it's, it's tough. I, I mean, I went through the same thing as you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. I worked for the flyers for 25 years and, and uh, you know, you got people say, you know, everyone's calling I'm sorry, you know, like this and that. And, and things happen for a reason. And you're like, fuck you. It does like, yeah. you know, this and that, that's not helping me right now, but now, you know, it, it took me a while, but things have, you know, I see a lot different now, like with yeah. what I do and, and, um, you were hurt. You were hurt yeah. Oh right? yeah. Big yeah. time. It's like you said, it, I, I connected with me right away. It's just like, first thing is I'm like, what do they, what do they think? Like, what is every? I can't say anything. What are people going to think of me? Like I was, you know, taking my kid to the rink and everybody knew, you know, not that I was by any means famous yeah, yeah. or anything, but a lot of people knew who I was. And right. like I, in my head, I'm like, are they looking at me? saying all oh, you know what did he do what did he do he had to have done something right, right. like so anyway but no, uh, I, you're right. and, you're, and, you're, you're, and you know what though like you can't you cannot and i refuse to live my life like this you can't blame anybody else i can't blame the nhl i'm the one that said it everything i have is because of the national hockey league gary bettman and i and bill daly i've met with them and I've told them that was not what I meant. You know, I just met with them six, eight months ago about some things. And, and, uh, I would never, every, they were tremendous to me, you know, financially, they could have, things could have been different. Maybe with my retirement and severance package, they could have maybe fired me with cause. They didn't do any of that. They treated me and my family very well. And, uh, 
I get it. They they had to protect the shield, and uh, and you can't you can, blaming other people serves no purpose. That's so right. We have to be, and then we need more of that in our in our world because everybody wants to fucking blame everybody else instead of looking them, at themselves. And we need people to be more accountable. Yeah, hundred percent. And and I I feel like I don't know this, but I feel like the person you are, they knew that, and that's why they you were looked after, you know, right. the way right. they did, because they know who you are and, and, uh, and anyone I've ever talked to and anyone that knows you around hockey knows what kind of guy you are. So, well, yeah, like I didn't all of a sudden say four weeks before I was going to retire. And I think I'm going to fucking blow this. Up. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. After, after 1362 games, I'm going to say something. Yeah. And, and our guys on staff, like, I don't, I don't, I can't even think of anybody that's been on staff that I worked with and, 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 uh, after they retired, like guys that went into a game going, I'm going to get this team or I'm going to get, like, you don't last for as long as I did or other referees, if that's your mindset, because right. that's, you know, we're, that's not who we are. Like, that's not, we're, we're there to serve the game and make it like I said earlier, fair for both teams. And uh, we would never go in with that kind of mindset. Yeah. And uh, we live in a world of uh, social media, right? Obviously the gambling things brought in. Um, but the reality is, is you, you owned it. And we, every single one of us on this planet, is fucked up in some way, shape or form. You know, we all got our own issues and stuff. So anybody that's sitting there casting stones, uh, you know, obviously is, is not being reflective of you know of, the, of their own situation and their own shit but uh you know you, you all you can do is be accountable own it and you know and move on right i mean it uh, is what it is it's like exactly. it's unfortunate but if it was 20 years ago it'd probably be a non-issue honestly oh, right i mean it's like probably right. not even talked about no. just the day and age uh you know you gotta be cameras everywhere right bugs everywhere <laughs> yeah exactly you, you gotta, gotta be careful yeah you, you see everyone always doing this now like i like, know right? even yeah. talk to their, like i don't blame them really yeah i know it's an interesting shit. world I, I do have one more question for you timmy we appreciate your time no um so i know you're golfing you you, you belong riley you should have riley out. <laughs> yeah right riley loves golf I'm kidding yeah. um he had a good show in a few weeks ago yeah right? no i don't uh, mind we the played experience. the flyers alumni Terrible. and uh riley had some big putts but um a little birdie told me you, you you like to give your money away to the chiropractor there for uh, St. Louis. Oh, <laughs> so you play him a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I Mike Murphy, he's the chiropractor for the league. Yeah, and I, I joke with Panger. I go, I'm I'm because him and I play a lot of golf together, and I always joke with both of them that I'm their human ATM machine. So, yeah. <laughs> but but I have got better the last. Uh, I'm ten handicap, and I got. Oh shit, that's good. Well, that's not bad. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna brag here. I was club champion last weekend. We had three. No. Days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, seventy-two holes of match play, and and uh, I was four up. This is a funny story. I was four up with twelve to go in the championship match, and I lose. And my wife and there's all kinds of people in the carts driving around watching and so on. And I I lose twelve. 13, 14, and 15. I'm leaking oil bad. And and uh, so now we're even going into 16, and I, I scraped out a win on 16 and 17 to close them out. Oh, man. But it's so funny because I could go in, into Philly or a uh, playoff game in Montreal with 20,000 crazy fans, and, and they're chanting, ref, you suck, and, and not even, it doesn't even bother you. But you get over a four foot putt that you need to make for par to win this match, and <laughs> you're shitting your pants. It's I was so say un- tighten up. Yeah, yeah, because it's so it's so in your comfort zone. It's not what you're used to. So it, it make it makes you appreciate those guys, like the you know in the PGA. Oh, well, I, know, I mean, right? it's like it's insane. Like like he said, when I play in my member guest with my stepdad, uh, I I'm. I'm nervous, yeah. man. Like I, I don't know if I ever got nervous playing basketball. Like I just didn't feel it, like but like that. But it's crazy. Yeah. You're right, man. It's it's a different feeling when you you got people watch. It can be four people. You know, oh, I know. Them, I feel the same way. And and there's like six <laughs> people watching. You're like, fuck, I got to hit this thing straight. A lot of pressure. <laughs> a lot of oh, mind man. games. But that's also. Hey, have you played with Craig Baruby? Have you been able to play golf with Chief? I have played with Chief a couple times. Yeah, he's he's pretty player. good, eh? He's a pretty good player, yeah. He's got, he's got pretty good mitts for a big guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was actually I texted him a couple, a couple weeks ago to say, hey, when you know when when you get back, uh, 
let me know so we can tee it up. Chief's a great guy. He's one of he my is. guys here. He's just, you know, he's just such a good person. And hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully they can turn it around this year. They didn't, uh, you know, they're, I think their defense kind of let them down last year. Bennington actually played unbelievable last year. Um, but they get some good young players and, and Doug Armstrong, as you know, both you guys know, he's one of the best GMs in the business. So yeah. we need, uh, we need the blues back in the playoffs because our Cardinals suck this year. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh man. Timmy, seriously, we can't thank you enough, man. We really appreciate you, brother. Yeah, this uh, is great. No problem, boys. I, I appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, maybe we'll do it again once the season gets going and, and talk, you, talk some hockey. So there you go. I see you guys are both doing well. So thank you. Appreciate you, Tim. Thanks, boys. All right, brother. Take care. Big thank you to Timmy Peel. What a beauty. Absolute beauty. Love that guy. Appreciate his time. Yeah, he's awesome, man. Interesting character for sure. What a what a career. <sighs> Thank God we didn't have mics on us once in a while. Oh, because, would have been canceled oh 20 God. years ago. Just think about oh, all the times and then, you know, uh, just a shitty situation. But uh, luckily, it, you know, he's handled it great. Yeah. And, um, he was he was at the end of his, you know, he had a month left. It would have been nice if he could have got that last game in St. Louis. Sure. But they had the big party, like he said, and uh, at his country club. So um, great guy. It was one of my favorite refs to ever talk to. I, I really liked him, so. Yeah, big thanks, Wish Timmy. Wish you the best, yep. No doubt. It's that time, Nast. Is it that time? It really is. It's time, baller, for the clear questions brought to you by Clear Rum. Riles, if you go to clearrum.com slash shop and type in Nasty2023, you get 35% off your order. Whew. Only in PA. Only in PA. So... Everyone in Pennsylvania, you'll want to get your hands on it. It's the most refreshing summer drink you'll get. It's awesome. Love these guys. You might want to tone it down. Summer, you're getting carried away with the beverages. I've gotten carried away, but I've had <laughs> fun with it. <laughs> yes, and it's so tasty, I don't care. And, and it's water. So you're hydrating, it water is. dehydrating. Exactly. So you're all exactly. good. Exactly. And they're great people. Oh, yeah, Love absolutely. Them. All right, Bob, we're, we're good to go. Nine Springer 9 over on Twitter. He wants to know. Ever go fishing with Mike Richards? Mm. Wow. Well, he is a fisherman. He really um, is. I have not actually fished with him, but I've been on his boat. What were we doing on that boat? Well, I'll tell you what I was doing. <laughs> I was having a tasty <laughs> beverage. It wasn't a clear rum because they weren't there yet. But uh, I was sitting right beside this silver trophy. I don't know. Oh. Maybe the Stanley Cup. Oh, okay. That I was on think. his boat. Yeah, we, were t we took it over... Uh, we did his second party, uh, went up to Kenora there. And, and uh, so I have been on his boat, have not fished, but that, uh, that silver cup got, some, it was like fishing with dynamite for the girls oh, to get in that boat. I will sure. say that, I'm sure. but, um, no, I have not fished with him, but, uh, Dustin Bufflin, our good friend, he fishes with him once in a while. And, uh, his, he's a big fisherman, but I have not fished with him. No. We got one from Skyler Flyers over on Twitter. Which current NHL player reminds you of yourself, Riley? Ooh. Is there anybody that can't skate or can't play out there, Ness? <laughs> Dude, you don't give yourself any credit. Uh, uh, God, that's a great question, though. I'm trying to think. As who's... far as, like, who's a guy? For me, it, I, I'm thinking... I want to say undersized for a guy that's fighting like you fought. Um, man, God, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking all these guys are, you know, they're, they're still playing the role. They're just like, they're just, they're just better than myself. Well, so it's, it's so like, different now. Right. Um, you know, as far as like, you know, maybe the, the attitude towards the role, maybe, you know, I see yeah. like Nick Deloria, you know, I mean, oh, I, feel, yeah. I feel, you know I mean? Yeah. I mean? But I mean, obviously he's, he's just a better player. I mean, all around, um, I'm trying to think of guys that are still scrapping, um, pretty regularly. I mean, still limited fighting, but right. it's, um, not, it's not like there's I'm a trying to see guys that have like that, you know, that relentless heart. There's not many guys that are, you know, again, it was, I played in a different era where I was able to, to act like that. And there's actually a thing. I mean, it's a little more, more composed now. I, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. Is there is there many guys floating around? That is, I guess Nick would be good because you know, like he he takes on everyone. He's not huge. Yeah. Um. Obviously, 
That's probably yeah. I mean, I, I would I say have to agree as far as that goes. Um, yeah. But I mean, he. I just want to be clear that he's a better player, <laughs> and he's you know, he's he's getting paid for it because he is you know he is he is efficient out there. So, um, but as far as like the the role itself and being hungry and, and yeah. you know and, and stepping up and showing up, I would probably say Nick Deloria. Good answer. Good question. Yeah, really good question. We got one more. Rich, not in Canada, over on Twitter. What team do you believe will take a major step forward and who will take a major step back in the 23-24 season? Hmm. I'm going to let you take that one, Nas, because I wow. have no clue wow. what's going on um, in the offseason here. <laughs> oh, man. I don't – gosh, man. A major step forward. Well, I'll say for first – I don't want to say major step backwards, but losing. Beat Bean Town, you're talking. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, that's what I was um, thinking. Um, I know he's older. You're losing Bergeron, and you're losing Krejci. Like, yeah, those are that's a lot to lose. But I don't want to say a major step back. I still see they still have Posse, they still have Marge, Oh yeah, they got a really sure. good team. They're back in. Um, but it's certainly an effect. Yeah, I think the 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 leadership. In some way, shape, or form. Yeah, even though they still do have sure. a good core group. God, there. man, that's that's a great question, but I'd really have to. Um, who had Who's to breaking through this year now? Yeah, like insane Boston as well. They did add Lucic and yeah. JVR, two veteran, some presence. veteran presence. Yeah, yeah, so that should help them. So I don't want to say they're going to take a major step backwards, but I don't see them breaking records like last yeah. year. I mean, obviously that was just insane the, the regular season. Um, and as far as the team, maybe, I don't know about major strides forward or steps forward, but uh, Baller had a good point about Columbus. Um, you know, they added Severson. They added uh, Provy. Um, the Fantelli. Yeah, Fantelli. Uh, you know, maybe. And they were banged up last year, too. Maybe yeah. maybe they take a step forward. With Babs, yeah, maybe, Babs that in charge. That scares me, man. <laughs> that scares me. But uh, maybe, you know, they take a step forward and get back into the playoffs. That's, you know. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So that's a great question. You like really stump me yeah. there because I have to really think about that. But I, I, I'm going to say Columbus maybe takes a step forward. And the fly guys. I, guess they, I, I see a step forward. Maybe not a huge one. Maybe you not, do? A step I don't forward. I think they want to take a step forward. Well, but I, th- I, I think. Are you they, talking about wins and losses or are you talking about. I think, well, yeah, I like to think wins and losses. I think just overall, I mean. Yeah, do they want to? Probably, probably not. In the this was the year to not. Yeah, to, to not do. But that, I think but naturally, yeah. I think they will. Yeah, um, I think you know you're getting Coots back. Obviously, we've talked about it. Cam. Yeah. Um. I. You know they're going to compete but, because Torts is back there. Like. Yeah, exactly. They're going to compete. I, I mean, so. I don't see. I don't see it being like a huge leap. But I mean, right. I like to think that they're inching in the right direction. But, yes, I for mean, sure, for sure. I'm also being a little biased. It's all right. But, you can do that. I think it's a wrap, Nast. Is it? 124 in the books. In the books. Appreciate you all. Be sure to tune in for episode 125 next week. Until then, stay safe, knuckleheads. Yep.